everybody so much for making the time to be here with us on a Sunday. And um, yeah, my name is Victoria. I'm the co-founder and president of FIVE. And for those of you who are here who don't really know what FIVE is, FIVE stands for FIVE MEO DMT Information and Vital Education. And I'll just read a little bit about us so you can, can get a good understanding. So our mission at FIVE is to help shepherd FIVE MEO DMT into the world in a safe and effective manner, starting with a centralized hub for resources and education on FIVE MEO DMT, engaging in clinical research and working towards FDA approved our website includes over 30 plus pages of free information on 5-MEO DMT, including integration specialists, monthly webinars like this one, scientific research, and more. In addition, 5 is known as the gold standard in 5-MEO DMT trainings, bringing together over 35 plus guest teachers and speakers over the course of nine months to provide students with the best education possible, with our next cohort beginning in January 2024. Five emphasizes and encourages a collaborative approach to work to this work and is proud to partner with individuals and organizations working towards a similar cause. Wow. So oh hey. yeah. we did it. We did it. We're so high high. But I can't I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, What's going on? You can't hear us yet. <laughs> Can you hear us? Can't hear anything. We're, we're almost there. Check your volume. One check second. Your volume. Let me check my Fucking Zoom, man. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Audio. Output volume. That's the speak. Uh, and that's why. Uh -huh. Check, okay, check. One second. MacBook Pro speakers. Okay. Check, check. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. All right. We All made right. it. Um, so <laughs> annoying. We have okay. a good love. <laughs> Andrew Rack, thank you for your patience. And everyone in the audience, thank you all for your patience. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. Yeah, we had a weird glitch. As soon as we tried to start the practice session, Zoom just wasn't opening for a while and then took us some weird re weird rerouting ways. Nah, maybe uh, maybe Mars is in retrograde or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was uh, I was just sharing a little bit about five, and so yeah, now that we know about five, let's kind of turn our awareness to the guest speakers here. So we've got Dr. Andrew Gallimore with us, and Dr. Andrew Gallimore is a computational neurobiologist, pharmacologist, chemist, and writer who has been interested in the neural basis of psychedelic drug action for many years and is the author of a number of articles and research papers on the powerful psychedelic drug DMT and its effects on the brain and consciousness. In 2015, he collaborated with DMT pioneer Rick Strash Strassman, the author of DMT and the Spirit Molecule, to develop a pharmacokinetic model of DMT as the basis of a target-controlled intravenous infusion protocol for extended journeys in the bizarre worlds to which DMT gates access. His current interests focus on DMT and other psychedelic molecules as tool a tool for gated, uh, for gaining access to otherwise inaccessible subjective worlds. Their neuro neuroscientific underpinning and their possible ontological and metaphysical implication. He currently lives and works in Tokyo. And also joining us is the one and the only Rak Razam. Rak Razam is an alchemical storyteller with his finger on the pulse of tomorrow and the heart of today, a screenwriter, Document, documentary, documentarian, author, journalist, and a plant medicine ambassador. His focus is on the cultural paradigm birthing in this brave new world. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Joel. All right, just a quick disclaimer. Five is focused on providing the world with resources to educate, inform, and promote harm reduction. The content of this webinar has not been evaluated by, evaluated by the FDA. 5-MeO-DMT and DMT should not be used to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases, conditions. 5 does not endorse or promote the use of 5-MeO-DMT or NNDMT and does not encourage or condone any illegal activities. You are solely responsible for understanding and complying with all laws that may be applicable to you. Isn't it a fun day and age where we get to say that? <laughs> I, I want to know where I can get it. I say it to myself it. every morning. Yeah. Yeah. We're on our way. We're on our way. That's a whole nother stressful story. <laughs> All right. So uh, just real quick, the uh, 
rules for tonight, or not rules, but um, everyone, we're, had, we're glad you're here with us. We'll go on a bit of a discussion for about a little under an hour, and then we'll open up for Q&A. If you have questions, comments, etc., leave them in the Q&A section, and we'll get to them as they come in, or as, uh, as we begin to address questions. All right. Rack or Andrew, anything you guys wanted to uh, say or ask or uh, share before we get started? I'd like to have a confession. I'm not a scientist, as my bio said. And I, I wouldn't say I'm intimidated. Andrew and I have met before. And as a journalist, I've interviewed him on my old podcast series. And um, I, I'd just like to say there's probably a really nice interplay here between what the differences are between 5-MeO and NNDMT. But I feel before you can get to that point, you almost need to understand the context of what's happening on both these substances, which um, really could be more than just a peak experience hallucination and more of an incursion into an interior geography that these chemicals may um, enable in our consciousness. So I'd like to sort of look at the context and then the differences and similarities maybe in an organic. Yeah, that actually leads us pretty perfectly in, you know, I would, uh, I'd love to hear from each of you. What is, you know, Rack, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about 5-MeO-DMT. And Andrew, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about DMT and why you're each so passionate about each respective molecule. Um, you know what? I originally was very passionate about NNDMT as well before 5-MeO came back into preference. I think NNDMT is a gateway drug for 5-MeO. It's even in the chemical structure, right? I mean, like, hello. Um, uh, just to say that the tryptamines, you know, it's believed they're quite endemic to consciousness itself and the, the realms that they reveal, both in the indigenous lineages um, and in the modern psych psycho nought type of um, paradigms are quite astounding and amazing. And, you know, anyone who's felt this, they don't feel like they're just hallucinations in any way, shape or form. So for many years, I was, you know, really following the late great Terence McKenna's sort of mapping of these realms and these potentials and his promulgation of both ayahuasca and DMT throughout the late 80s, early 90s and into the 2000s. And this has just been the most remarkable terra incognita, the invisible landscape that, you know, these substances can reveal. So I started off very much um, enamored with NNDMT and then it wasn't really until um, 5-MeO came back my way with the Buffo Alvarius toad that it sort of transcended NNDMT. But if I can look at my seven years with 5-MeO now and pretty much my seven years with NNDMT previously, I think that allows me to look at the context and the cohesion that they almost have been for me um, building blocks or um, a, a sort of mm, a stepping stones from one medium to the other. Um, and that they're both intimately connected, not just in the experience and visions or non-visions or what you're experiencing, you know, um, experientially, but in the geography that is explored. I really believe that they're, they're so complementary, like one leads to the other. It's almost as if there's a baseline frequency, baseline consciousness. You go up one sort of level to a hyperspatial astral level with content and all the aliens, architectures, ancestors, all of that stuff. And if you keep going up, you end up at the white light or the, the absence of that content, um, which um, one graduates into the other. So um, anyway, that's my introductory bit. I'm sure we can get into some nitty gritties in a bit. Thank you, Rack. Andrew. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can echo what Rack says. I mean, for me, certainly, um, a friend once said to me about a guy called Carl Smith, who was actually one of the participants in the uh, Imperial College London DMTX study, the extended state DMT. And um, years and years ago, he said to me, DMT is like the fifth dimension and 5-MeO DMT is like the 12th dimension. Um, and he also described an experience during his extended state DMT, where he was in the DMT space and he saw the 5-MeO DMT space kind of there. He could see it somewhere. He could see like the portal towards that. Um, and uh, as Rack quite correctly said, I think it is you pass through this space of immense complexity and form. 
uh, of structure of of content uh, that seems way beyond anything that's uh, that could possibly exist within our lower dimensional slice of reality. This um, far simpler three plus one dimensional world that we occupy. DMT seems to and NDMT um, seems to occupy or allow you to reach a, a realm that is beyond anything in in our lower dimensional slice of reality uh, and extreme complex and it is full of content, full of form, uh, full of uh, intelligent beings. And because of that, it's actually in a sense quite easy to study, right? You've got a lot to kind of get your teeth into with, with DMT. Um, which is why, well, the main reason why I talk about DMT and I study DMT and think about and write about and research DMT is because there's a lot to, to get your teeth into. Um, once you get to 5-MeO, which I do think is the um, is when you move past the form and the content into no form, no content, um, this pure white light, as Rack called it, and as many other people like to call it. Um, and so I think there is a continuum there. I, I think there is this deep relationship between the two molecules. The problem, I think, is that is how do you study formless white light you know as a as a as a neuroscientist and as someone who wants to um write about these kind of things how how do you how do you study something it's it's it's, it's almost zen you have a, almost like a zen like problem here uh and that you know whatever you say about it isn't it not this not this uh and so it's like well what the fuck do i do with that um I, you know, from an academic or scientific perspective, it's actually very difficult to kind of grasp. I think is one of the reasons um, that 5M MEO is is less written about is because, in a way, whilst there's everything to say about it, there's also absolutely nothing <laughs> to say about it, um, other than you can't describe it, right? Uh, that it's ineffable, and it's like, okay, where do we go from there? Um, so, so that's kind of why I've I've stayed in the relatively, I would say, um, lower dimensional space of of DMT, which is still a lifetimes and more work um, to get your head around it and to try and understand it. Um, but making that connection, that link between DMT and 5-MeO, I think is very important. Uh, but at the same time, you are you're reaching into realms where very little can be said. Um, you can study the neuroscience, you can look at neural activity, you can look at how these um, molecules, which we'll probably get into, is how they differ in terms of how they interact with the brain and, and the and why they have such, despite being extremely closely related, um, there's very, very little difference structurally between 5-MeO-DMT, well, it's just that 5-methoxy group, that's literally the difference. Um, and yet the effects in a way could be couldn't be more different um, um, but yeah I think studying it beyond that um, trying to explain and describe and you know put words to the experience I think is is, is quite a challenge wouldn't you say Rack? <laughs> <laughs> I would but I always beg to differ because um, it is it is ineffable and it is sort of translinguistic, but uh, so, so are most aspects of the great mystery. I think what we're really describing here is levels of engagement of the ego functionality. And obviously in the content driven DMT frequency, um, there's a lot of content to sort through. So the ego is always reacting to that and trying to make sense of that, you know, in navigation. With 5-MeO though, there's still a spaciousness and there's still a presence of mind. It's just that the the egoic mind, I like to say, is invited to let go, but it doesn't always. And some strong minds hold on. And there's almost like a lucid dreaming quality of witnessing consciousness, which can go into deep source just around the event horizon of maybe we could call it a nerva culpa samadhi and no mind where it goes. But there is capacity to know, to be, um, to be connected to the source of all things. And, and this language, you know, obviously, you know, is something the ego frameworks around when it comes back. But it's almost like a, um, 
a fetal type of consciousness when you're deep in 5-MeO. And what I'd like to ask Andrew is I did see some study recently that was looking at the receptor sites. And there was, I think it was your DMT extended research study where they were saying that even on the extended um, immersion and on big doses, ego was still present on, on NNDMT. So obviously, MEO, the ego is invited to let go. And I think this is the key differentiator. And then the quality of information you can bring back from that. And just to say that in my years of working with 5MEO and being involved in the community, um, you know, I have sort of blended and come into the more, I guess you'd say, mystic stream, which I think science feels that it has an opposition to or a disconnect from, even though maybe originally centuries ago they had a, a, a you know, a stem where they were connected. Um, but there is language and there is mapping, especially in the Vedic mapping and the, the sort of yogic traditions, which Joelle and I have been doing, you know, work with bridgingheaven.com, looking at low-dose meditation and 5-MeO to describe levels of egoic consciousness into the full release. But yeah, I would, uh, you know, uh, agree that it's more challenging for the ego to bring content back, but it is possible. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think, so as you mentioned, the, 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 the DMTX study, that was something that was, well, I mean, you can go back decades now. I remember Terence McKenna used to always say that, that DMT in a way doesn't affect your mind. Um, and in the sense that you aren't, you don't feel intoxicated. Uh, it's, it's as if you are witnessing this, you are, you are, your mind and your ego remains fully intact. And yet here you are in this most, uh, to say the least, strange um, alternate environment, uh, which can make it all the more terrifying, I think, um, in that you don't get the chance to let go of, of this frightened self um, that you do with, with high dose 5-MeO perhaps. Um, and so it was kind of cool, I think, when these first DMTX studies started coming out and they were actually taking measures of um, the, the sense of ego loss throughout the experience. And they did note that that, uh, that unlike with high doses of psilocybin or, or LSD, um, you do seem to re retain that ego function, um, which is an interesting effect um, because the ego is tied up with you know it's part of this model that we, our brain is always constructing this external world model the internal world model the relationship between the two and the ego is all tied up with that it's all part of this grand model if you like that your brain is constructing uh, and so you do kind of expect the ego to um uh, to disintegrate but you don't see that with dmt um and and why that's the case is is kind of not quite clear but i think my intimation is that part of what the ego is doing is 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 or part, part of what the ego is without getting mystical um kind of whilst trying to kind of remain neuroscientific which i always try to do um, the ego is part of that uh, or is instantiated in this relationship between uh, what's going on in your head or what's apparently going on in your head and some and uh, your relationship to the world basically and, and how you keep those separate and how you maintain yourself as a distinct entity separate from your environment uh, and that's kind of how the ego feels like. It feels like something, uh, this subjective self that is distinct from everything else. Um, and I think with DMT, because this DMT world does seem to be a completely alternate external environment, it doesn't feel like um the uh, you know a dream or uh, any kind of visionary experience in a way it does feel like you're entering a new world uh and so it it makes sense to me that that you can still maintain this sense of uh of of a self uh, witnessing and being part of or interacting with some other environment um whereas with something like psilocybin and and and, and 
LSD at normal doses, at least, um, all of that is kind of um, dissolved and you find yourself merging with with the environment you find yourself becoming one with the environment and there's no differentiation between the self and the environment for some reason dmt is kind of different you you maintain that sense of self you maintain that sense of a subjective being that's 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 having a relationship with this completely alien world and somehow the ego somehow it kind of remains intact there um, but I don't think we understand why that's happening yet um, or, or what the kind of the neural correlates uh, of that are. But to me, it's, a, again, another indication that DMT is somehow special uh, and that, as I've always maintained, um, it, I think it's extremely difficult to explain the content and the structure uh, of these DMT worlds um, without invoking some source of extrinsic um, sensory information some alternate source of sensory information that your brain is receiving um and so that the maintenance of the ego i think is, is all part of that and that you truly are maintaining yourself as a a watcher uh, an experience of some uh, other uh, reality but i'm not sure how that once you get into 5 meo dmt then then things start to change right then you 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 are no longer there is no longer any separation at all uh, and you, you you transcend even um what you achieve with with dmt um so uh, yeah i'm not sure um what you think the relationship is there right could i, could I grill andrew on some science here because my assumption and what i sort of been going on is that you know nndmt we talk about receptor sites but in general most psychedelics are helping or they originally thought lowering the default mode network and i think recently they're not sure if it's accentuating default mode network but definitely that regional cluster of the brain the default mode um a colleague of mine dr juan acosta who has since passed a few years ago did uh, some seminal nndmt and 5meo eg studies um that were published a few years ago and his analysis uh, of the data was that 5-MEO as well as the default mode network is actually targeting the frontal and parietal lobes of the brain and lowering the le electrical activity there and at least anecdotally that's sort of where this or at least partially where the sense of I or the ego is generated but it seems to be that's there's got to be something that 5-MEO is is hitting that is affecting the ego and lowering the ego or dissolving it and diffusing it where uh, NNDMT seems to focus it, you know, into, into focusing and all the data and information that's coming. But are there different uh, areas that are being targeted within the tryptamines? So this is it's a great question. I can't give you a definitive answer. I think the everyone has been since, well, 2012, uh, like for a decade, basically, um, everyone's talking about the, the default mode network. And this comes out of uh, Imperial College's pioneering work, prime, you know, originally at least. Uh, and everyone focused on this effect, um, this assumption that the breakdown of these large scale networks. So the brain is a network of networks of networks of networks, networks all the way down. So you have these large scale networks, which are basically areas of the brain that are speaking to each other and that help control activity over large parts of the brain. And the default mode network is one of those networks. You have other networks as well that become engaged during different types of neural activity, during different types of tasks. Uh, and the DMN is this default. It's, it's, it's thought to be that, um, that network that is engaged when you're not actively um, interacting with or performing tasks in the, the so-called outside world. Uh, and so the dissolution of that, the breakdown of that, as well as other networks as well that you see uh, with with psychedelics has, has always been assumed, I think, to be this hallmark of the, the loss of, of ego function. But more recent data with, with other drugs has, has seen similar kind of breakdown of this of default mode um intra network connectivity even in completely non psychedelic drugs so i think now the whole idea that yeah it's the, the dmn that's what you've got to look for and if if that starts to break down then you're going to see loss of ego that is not as not as sure footed you know it's, it doesn't sit as uh, uh, on as solid a foundation as 
it was once assumed. So it doesn't surprise me at all um, that you're starting to see what might be kind of paradoxical or unexpected effects um, with with um, with certain drugs where loss of the ego doesn't correlate to loss of the DMN or loss of the DMN connectivity doesn't cause um, apparent subjective loss of ego. I think we just don't understand the ego that as well as perhaps we thought we did. Um, now, with to kind of uh, get to the second part of your question again i can't be definitive about it because i just don't think we we know enough but you know nndmt and 5 meo dmt they're working via they're both nominally the cla they're both nominally members of the classic psychedelics right which are these um as most people will know these um tryptamine psychedelics generally not always um that bind to and activate these tonin risk this particular subtype the 5-ht2a uh, receptor and all the classic psychedelics that's their kind of primary locus of activity um but then you've got all these other receptor subtypes which are tickled to various degrees by uh, psychedelics and the overall effect you're going to get with a psychedelic will depend upon that particular pattern of receptor station um and so uh, uh, sasha shulgin described it like an orchestra uh, each of your receptors is uh, an instrument within that orchestra it's 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 stimulating it's manipulating um, neural activity in its own distinct way and the overall sound that you get in other words the overall subjective effect will depend upon um, which receptors are activated, in other words, which instruments are sounding, but also how those receptors are activated. It's another layer of complexity. So how you play the instrument um, will also determine the overall sound of the orchestra. Um, you know with DMT, it activates HT2A, of course, in its own particular manner. Uh, with Foxy DMT, it's kind of different. Uh, in that it's much more selective for this other serotonin receptor subtype, it's called the 5-HT1A. Um, now, for 5-MeO-DMT, it is still a classic psychedelic. You can still block its subjective effects to some degree, at least, by blocking this 5-HT2A receptor. It's still a classic psychedelic, but it, it re relies much more on uh, stimulation same time as the these 5-HT1A receptors. Now 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A, without getting too technical, um, they are they they antagonize each other. So 5-HT2A, when you activate, will actually um, excite the neurons within which the receptor is embedded. And 5-HT1A tends to do the opposite. It makes the neuron less excitable. This uh, push and pull effect and the balance of 5-HT1A versus 5-HT2A will determine the overall effect on the neuron's excitability. And so what 5-MeO-DMT is doing is it's because it's the balance is tipped towards 5-HT1A, you're getting a, a different overall effect uh, on neural activity. And this is made even more complex uh, is because these receptors type, subtypes are located in different types of the brain. Yes, um, there is this population of very important neurons deep in the deep layers of the cortex called these called the cortical uh, pyramidal cells where psychedelics were um, primarily. Uh, but you also have populations of these receptors in different parts of the brain as well. Uh, and so if for example, and I don't know if this necessarily to be the case or if it's been studied, if you have populations of 5-HT1A receptors in, let's say, frontal areas of the brain, um, someone might want to look at that, um, then you would get um, uh, a more pronounced uh, effect in this part of the brain or, or 5-MeO-DMT would be affecting um, the frontal areas of the brain more specifically that something that DMT would. And since 5-HT1A is a 
uh, it's an inhibitory receptor, it reduces the excitability. You might see kind of some kind of shutdown um, effect in this frontal part of the brain, as well as um, the, the, the more global effects um, by affecting the 5-HT1A and 5-HT2A um, in the kind of uh, the upper and the back uh, areas of the cortex. Um, so, so, so kind of to summarize, the overall effect that you're getting is, is, is the, the emergent pattern of neural activity um, that results from this particular pattern of receptor stimulation in different areas of the brain. Um, and, and so that's the effect that you're observing with, with 5-HT, uh, sorry, with 5-MeO-DMT uh, compared to, to, to NN, NN-DMT. Isn't there also something happening with the Hertz frequency, like the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you know, that type of stuff that what I've read is yeah. the, like the normal alpha, beta sort of consciousness on 5-MeO goes into gamma and it's like a hyper coherence. Is that either accurate and is also is have you seen that on an NDMC what what sort of frequency of uh, consciousness yeah that's a good question so so the so neural activity um so again it, it all goes back again to the receptors but when when you have large numbers of neurons that are being stimulated in in a certain way they 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 become coherent they tend to synchronize their activity to some extent because they're all connected right they're all speaking to each other and this the this patterns of coherent activity you see uh, as patterns of coherent electrical activity uh, and the brain works at as you said at a number of different frequencies so you have very high frequencies so the, these gamma frequencies you're talking about which is very important in um, synchronizing activity over large areas of the cortex uh, and then you get down to um, lower and lower frequencies. So uh, you have, you know, beta and alpha, which is e even lower. Uh, and so different the patterns of receptor stimulation will, will cause different um, patterns of uh, electrical activity to emerge. And so, yes, if you were to see um, uh, increase. So the, the kind of the hallmark of a psychedelic effect is is actually de desynchronization. Uh, broadly so you're seeing a decrease in alpha and beta wave activity suggesting that uh, activity is becoming more disorganized because synchronized oscillations suggest organized activity um, whereas desynchronized suggests very differentiated very independent activity and there's always a balance between them right your brain is always trying to strike a balance it has to be uh, organized it has to be coherent otherwise the world would just be a buzzing mess and there would you know, your brain wouldn't be able to achieve anything it wouldn't be able to maintain a stable model of reality uh, um, and yet at the same time it has to um, there has to be um, some level of desynchronization what parts different parts of the brain have to be able to work independently as well and so there's always this um, synchronization and then desynchronization and resynchronization going on all the time and it's extremely complex and extremely beautiful really um, and psychedelics will certainly disrupt that uh, and so you tend to see this loss of alpha power which loss of alpha wave synchronization basically you know when these um, oscillations synchronize you get an increase in the signal because there's it's like two sounds that are um um that are what's the word harmonious and training yeah 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 exactly I'm, uh, it's early in the morning here for me but uh but yeah so you get this it's like when you have um two waves that are what am i i can't think of the word synthetic vibration yeah something like that right uh <laughs> but when you when you have lots of these when these alpha waves are very synchronized then you get a, a a stronger reading basically on the EEG is, is is kind of the the take home message there and and you will see that you see that drop away when you give someone a psychedelic you will start to see this reduction in the alpha power but you also often see an increase in these gamma waves if you, as you said which is just global synchronization so you're getting these very interesting patterns that can can emerge now uh, i'm not sure uh, how much there's been far less 5-MeO work done, you know, compared to the other classic psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, it would be really interesting to see. And I'm not 
hundred percent familiar with um, how much five ME um, MEO DMT work has been done in humans. Well, we've got uh, we've got an exciting mm-hmm. study um, this January, uh, Andrew. If you haven't heard, we'll be taking ah. two volunteers to get a uh, the full reading of the peak four to six minutes of the five MEO experience with a specialized sixty four cap EEG. And so it'll be uh, it'll be it'll be really really. And this is with um, University College of London. And so it'll be really good to start getting some really usable data and to get getting to understand the neural mechanisms behind what is going on there. Right. Yeah. So that would be you see. So I, I think um as 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 Rack said, um that is what I would expect to see. If you started to see that, if you start to see a drop off in these lower frequencies, um, like alpha and ga- uh, alpha and beta, and then you start to see a much higher synchronization in the gamma range, that would suggest that you're entering this hyper synchronized state which you would predict subjectively um to be much less differentiated um much less full of uh, different content and it, it should approach one would expect that kind of more um formless uh, more white light state the same kind of state or related to in some way to the state that you, you see with meditators for example you stick a, m- a very experienced meditator into an, uh, uh, someone who can meditate within a, an mri machine which is uh, uh, quite a feat in itself i think but if you can repeat you know the, you, this sort of study has been done and certainly with eeg it's been done and again you, you see these increase in these particular uh, high frequency um oscillations which which would be similar i think or, or hopefully it, it should be similar to what you see with with 5 meo dmt mm-hmm. I, i've seen those studies and i mean there wasn't a, a centralized study comparing them but if you look at the two studies of the monks meditating with eg and people on 5 meo with eg <laughs> they're basically identical brainwave readings it's there we go. Doing the same thing that's why i always say 5 meo mm-hmm. is like an ex- it's an internal you know mechanism but if we take it externally then it's an external catalyst to do the same thing. It's like a hyper meditation more than a traditional. Mm-hmm. Speaking of catalyst, I'd love to, um, you know, both of you have spoken about um, baseline consciousness or kind of baseline reality. Racker, you spoke about that earlier with the five MEO experience. And uh, Andrew, I've heard you speak about, um, you know, potentialities of contact with, um, with communications coming from the kind of, foundational fabrics or baseline fabrics of our reality. I'd love to hear from both of you around your feelings around potential implications of, you know, what we as humanity can learn from these non-ordinary states or uh, where we can go with these. Well, it's pretty profound, isn't it? I mean, maybe the indigenous people were right. Maybe there's a whole ecology on higher vibrational sort of frequencies um, where there are beings maybe as you know andrew says in his book maybe it's like reality channeling and changing the channels um maybe there's an infinite spectrum of density of life and intelligence spread throughout i know that you know um it's it's hard to gauge i mean a lot of the the iconography a lot of the visionary there's there's uh stages or there's um capacities within nndmt where you know, McKenna used to describe you, you'd end up at the chrysanthemum, like the waiting room, and maybe there's like these vague, you know, entities there that are waiting to shepherd you on. Or if you have a full breakthrough, you end up in some sort of virtually real um, three-dimensional alien vista. Uh, and there seemed to be a commonality as well. There's, you know, uh, David J. Brown um, is just releasing a book on uh, DMT and the visionary state and uh, with Sarah, someone who's doing the illustrations. But, um, you know, there's um, essentially there's archetypes which are perennial in in that that realm. And if we look at all the different cultures in the world, when they've had uh, entheogens and they've worked in the realms and they've gone in, they seem to report similar beings. You know, we see a lot of architecture. We see potentially sort of Atlantean, Golden Age sort of buildings and civilizations. The real question is, are these, you know, independent um beings and and realms or are they some type of mythopoetic archetypal um imprint you know that we're tapping into our genetic memory or you know it's it's still undecided but it seems to be there was a um an experiment done in the mid noughts by dmt nexus one of the online blogs where they did a hyperspatial um sort of geolocation where 
at the same time. And they were mapping and, and looking at the locations, a bit what D DMTX is doing in a more professional way now, and looking at the commonality where maybe everyone has a little different language base of how they describe it. But like, yeah, there was the face of the Sphinx and then there was the praying mantis laying lava legs to the left, you know. And if what does that say if you can go into these realms and that other people can experience the exact same beings and locations um, that you have and that maybe other cultures have also described and mapped. I mean, there's a curious commonality there. So that's the NNDMT and 5-MeO, it's the infinite formless void, which is pregnant with everything. Just talking about those receptor sites thing and the 2A and the 1A, it seems to me that one's the visionary one, the 2A one, and maybe the 1A is not as visionary, but you know what I've felt when I'm going into the white light is like it's pregnant with everything. You know, in the in the visible spectrum, white light is like all color. It's like you see beings in 5-MeO, but around the periphery of going into deep sources, the ego is fully dissolving. I sort of feel like they're all there. We're just not seeing them. We're feeling them. Um, and so, you know, what, what are these realms? I mean, it, it's either... The, the consensual, independent uh, states of being that we're tapping into or the capacities within ourselves. But that's the question, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, yeah, it most certainly is the question. I think, I mean, I, 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 I avoid for the most part, I always reel back a little bit when people start talking about, you know, higher vibrational states and things like that, because I think... You, if, it would be kind of committing academic suicide for me to, to start talking about this kind of thing. Uh, but I don't think it's not because I think it's wrong, uh, but I think it's 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 easy to start talking about because there's a lot of woo also associated with the idea of vibration. You know, you're you you're entering a very you know very low lower vibrational state at the moment. I can detect it in your aura. Uh, that kind of thing i mean maybe there's something in that i don't know um but there is definitely you know i'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater here uh because you know a higher vibrational state if you like i mean i think of that from a neuroscientific perspective like that mean uh, someone says and i'm thinking about okay i'm talking about neural oscillations i'm talking about uh, electrochemical vibrations in going on in the brain um, and I've always focused on the uh, try tried to think about DMT from an uh, an information theory perspective, and in in that what's happening with DMT, I think, uh, is that it's somehow gating the flow of information from some other place, uh, allowing your brain to construct an alternate world model um, i've always maintained and continued to maintain that this you know the normal waking world as i always say is a model of the world it's a model that's being constructed from a neural information by your brain all the time um, but your brain is also sampling patterns of information from the environment um, that allows it to constantly model and test this model against sensory information so it's all about the flow of information basically into the brain um, that allows the brain to construct this this world model and when you take dmt uh, what seems to be happening or what certainly is happening is your brain is constructing this alternate world model uh, a world model that's not just slightly different uh, but that bears no relationship whatsoever to the normal waking world model um, it is um, it's almost disjoint in that there's there's nothing that's taken from the normal waking world and brought into uh, the DMT world. Um, so the question then is, is that alternate world model being modulated by sensory information from some other environment? And I think it's extremely difficult to explain how the brain, which has evolved to construct one world model which is the model of the environment this is one of the primary functions of your brain is as this world builder this world model builder which is a model of the environment and it took your brain or the human brain or brains millions of years of evolution 
um, to learn to construct a stable and meaningful and functional and adaptive model of this environment. It's not an, a simple thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to achieve. I don't think we realize how uh, complex at times, you know, the world around us is, and that all that that world, that subjective world that we're experiencing is being constructed by your brain on the fly all the time. Um, so your brain's ability to suddenly switch when perturbed by this simple plant alkaloid and start constructing a world with almost almost effortlessly it, it's it, it switches its its reality channel and starts constructing these hyper coherent highly you know crystalline clear inordinately complex reality models that bear no relationship whatsoever to the model that your brain evolved to build that isn't easy to explain uh, no matter what people will say uh, say oh it's just you know it's just a psychedelic drug your brain is just trying to make sense of patterns of um, you know noisy patterns of disordered neural activity and no 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 that's that's not a good explanation um, because these worlds they're not just um, kind of pieced together um, from patterns of neural activity it's it's a very it's a very coherent and um, uh, inordinately complex and hyperdimensional world that is that your brain just somehow knows how to construct and I don't think that's easy to explain unless you invoke some other source of information um, in other words, some alternate source of sensory information that somehow DMT is allowing your brain to access. Um, so, so I think the we can then ask ourselves, well, what kind of neural state would the brain be in when it uh, that would allow it to receive information from some other space? And it would be the kind of the psychedelic state. The psychedelic brain state, if you like, is one in which um, the brain is much more fluid. Neural activity is much more fluid. Um, it's like heating up a piece of glass. If you heat up a piece of glass, it's at first very, very rigid and very fragile, but then you can kind of mold it to any shape that you like. So this kind of um, fluid state is much more susceptible to information-driven reorganization. So if you wanted to create a brain state where it was more susceptible to receiving information from some other source, it would be the psychedelic state. So that's broadly what I think is going on or could be going on with DMT is I think that um, it, is, it is generating this particular type of neural activity um, that allows your brain that is both highly fluid, but also uh, highly complex as well. Um, so it's like it is able to kind of, in a way, tune in um, to this these particular patterns of information that are coming from some other place. Um, and I don't think we don't really have a clue what I mean by some other place. Um, but clearly there seems to be some other place that is populated by intelligences. And I just I think that is a... Um, it's a shattering idea in a way because it completely uproots all of our basic fundamental ontological assumptions about who we are and the nature of our reality and our relationship to broader reality um, and kind of um, brings brings us to the 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 shattering conclusion that actually we are existing within a very thin slice of something much larger much more complex uh, much more difficult to understand or may perhaps even impossible to understand um, and it's a place that we can reach into um, with great facility by inhaling a couple of lungfuls of one of the simplest plant alkaloids um, that's ubiquitous and everywhere um, so so yeah so that's what i would say is i think dmt is not i i always come from it uh, come to DMT from a nearer scientific perspective and try try to explain it in that regard uh, from that perspective. But I, I think it's very difficult to explain DMT. It remains difficult. You know, I've been trying for twenty years uh, to try to explain what's going on with DMT, and I think um, the more I study it, the more I think actually there is something far far stranger going on uh, here that could indeed involve some other 
um, type of uh, intelligence or vast numbers of intelligences. You, you know what I've been saying since 2006? This space is the new outer space, right? And there, it's it's like a, a language thing. Science has a certain language with certain filters on it as well. And we can obviously see outer space around us. But this idea of inner dimensionality and that there could be beings in inner dimensionality is no less valid than there being beings in outer space. In fact, you know, it's maybe even more probable. I don't know. But I mean, with these technologies of the sacred, we seem to be able to tune in. But I think, again, like we said at the start, to understand and give a context to this exploration as exploration, right? And science is all so caught up in PTSD and trauma and placing antidepressants and the capitalist, you know, corporadelic approach to psychedelics at the moment that really science, I feel, really should be. I, you know, kudos to Andrew and Rick Strassman and the, the team in the UK doing the extended state DMT immersion because I think it's one of the first times Strassman's study in the 90s was really rigorously looking at the physical effects. And this one seems to be at least more liberally open to the idea of um, hearing the subjective um, encounters that people experience and you know mapping that data. It's like we can use science as a lens to go inwards and to look at this realm if we ask the right questions. And so I think, you know, we we are starting to do that, which is exciting. Yeah, I, I think it also, it the, the whole idea of inner versus outer, um, our, that very kind of Western perspective and that we have the inner world, which is just your mind, and then everything else is happening outside. I think even that starts to break down. And so what do we mean by inner space versus outer space i think even that when you realize that actually all of that outer world is is all happening in there anyway um the whole i the whole separation the whole distinction between the inner and the outer also starts to break down so in a way it's like it, it doesn't even make any sense to talk about inner versus outer or the idea that the dmt space is an inner space whereas the, the normal waking world is outer space it's all happening within inner or it's all happening in this this um this 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 um this neural architecture um so in a sense it's all inner um and also all outer and also all neither inner nor outer <laughs> i love it i love it well guys we're going to get on to some questions and uh, see, so we've got some good questions in here. Real quick, before we get into those, I'll just address, I think there's one or two of them that we can rock out really quickly. Uh, Mr. Chris Bova and Lisa and a few other people just asked about the memories and or, and or effects of 5-MeO-DMT wearing off after a few weeks. Yes, this is common. The It is very hard to have a subjective memory of something where the subjective mind was not present for. Um, and so, yes, that is very common. Just like a dream, the memory will fade. Um, however, this does not mean that effects will wear away. This can all be solved with integration. If you are doing 5-MeO-DMT, have an integration specialist. Work with an integration specialist. The difference is night and day. The attempt to, you know, how do we take an ineffable experience and allow it to make sense in our daily life if we're not engaging with the process? And so a talented integration specialist will be able to work with you to engage with the process and to work with and draw from the content that can be found from that opening that is created. The 5-MEO experience isn't about the content necessarily that you experience in there, but more so the connection and opening that it allows um, afterwards. And uh, first question, for Dr. Gallimore, in reality switch technologies, you spoke extensively about the models of reality, which our brains predict and generate how psychedelics will break down these, mod uh, these models, but spoke mostly about the models in terms of visual models of self, ego, etc. I'm curious about models relating to body schema and control of the musculoskeletal system. Do you have any insights of how these kinds of models are affected by the psychedelic experience in general? And furthermore, how 5-MeO and NN might affect body schema models differently. Um, okay, I can answer some of that question. Um, so yeah, so your, your what do you refer to, the body schema? Yeah, your, your body or your experience of having a body is also part of this model as well. Um, so, so you have a body model uh, that's incorporated as part of 
the visual and the the auditory and um the whole thing your whole experience world you have this model with it you have your bottle body within it but whilst we usually think of the body as kind of separate as a separate thing that we have or our brain has it's actually our experience of our body is also part of that model uh and that is also susceptible to being disrupted by psychedelics and so um when you take you know high doses of um something like psilocybin or lsd you will often experience a loss of that sense of a body and become a point people often describe in high dose psychedelic experiences as feeling like a point in space or a single point of awareness where the body appears to be lost you know that the, the modeling of, of of your body in real time is lost and 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 that also applies with dmt i don't think very in trying to think back to my own experiences um it's something that most people don't think about you're so focused on the the visual aspects of the experience that you don't necessarily think too much about whether you have a body um but in my experience and i think in most people's experiences it's it's like you don't have a body it's like you are floating or that you are simply a point of awareness and that makes perfect sense because as i said you know this body is is part of that that model uh, as well and uh, whether it's different for different psychedelics it's possible uh, again i don't think it's been studied um kind of systematically or formally in any way of of how different psychedelics affect uh, your body models uh, it's reasonable it's possible um that certain psychedelics will affect your body differently i mean we know for example uh, that certain psychedelics um, i think it's let me think now is it die which is the auditory one? Is that dipropyl? DET? Or is it? I don't think it's DET. I think oh. DET is more similar to. But anyway, it's a tryptamine. So there is one particular tryptamine. Someone who's smart can put it in the chat. Uh, I think it might be DPT. But anyway, uh, there's one particular tryptamine. Uh, which is primarily an auditory hallucin uh, hallucinogen or auditory psychedelic. So you don't get visual effects, but you get very strong auditory effects. So you think of the auditory as being a different part of that, that model. It's one uh, dimension of your world model. Uh, now, why would certain tryptamines, certain psychedelics affect that part, that particular dimension of your world model and not the visual um, is, is, is unknown? Um, and people have thought about it. Uh, and I think, you know, ha I was speaking to Hamilton Morris um, a few months ago, and he he actually did some experiments trying to find are there differences in the expression of certain genes when it's uh, when you um, um, administer this particular auditory hallucination kind of difference. Um, it would be good to get one of these psychedelics uh, in the brains of someone in, in an MRI scanner so you can actually see you know the different you would expect to see uh, in certain parts of the brain where you know the sides of the brain the temporal lobes where, where audit whether the kind of the auditory part of the model uh, is instantiated and you would expect to see differences there uh, and if you wanted to look at effect on the body part of the model or the body dimension of the model then you would look for uh, uh, changes in activity in, in other parts of the brain but it's 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 one aspect I think of of, of psychedelics that we uh, as with many aspects really of psychedelics that we just don't understand fully that is that though there's been um, a lot of well recent sort of research and looking at the role of tryptamines including nndmt for stroke victims i think in the uk they're using it with paramedics, obviously sub-threshold doses, so you're not going into the state. But there's something about what we're finding tryptamines in general, which have a neuroprotective uh, capacity to protect the brain from oxygen loss in near-death uh, sort of situations. There's the neuroplasticity. There's the anti-inflammatory sort of response with both 5 meo and, and NNDMT. These things really do affect the body. Um, and, and it's like they're starting to study them. It's quite exciting because if it protects the brain, it's got this functionality. We know that the near-death experience has been a recent study comparing 5 meo experiences to near-death experiences. And again, virtually identical. So what quality of the visioning and going into these realms, but it's also protecting your physiology as you go in. Mm. Package deal. Package deal, yeah. Yeah, I love it. All right, next question. 
Uh, well, real quick, just for harm reduction purposes, Suzanne, no, it is not safe for just anyone to take 5-MeO-DMT or DMT. Um, there are physical contraindications, medication contraindications, psychological contraindications, uh, a lot of things that can go wrong. So do do your research, work with a competent facilitator, and uh, know your source. Um, for more harm reduction information, go to 5-MeO.education. We've got all the information you'd ever need to know to keep yourself safe with at least 5-MeO-DMT. All right, next question. Why do you think it is that people report encountering the same DMT entities and have such similar experiences? Um, okay, I'll start. Um, well, there are a number of explanations, um, some more satisfying than others. Some would say, if you are Jungian, you would say, well, these are archetypes, right? Um, you'll see archetypal structures and that we all carry within ourselves this uh, neural heritage um, that we we all inherit the propensity to form certain types of image, images. Uh, and, and whilst that is certainly true to an extent, I think it's often overhauled the idea that archetypes explain um, the types of entities that you meet in the DMT space. I think certainly the brain draws upon these kind of very low level old basic patterns in order to construct its ongoing model um, so it's not surprising even if you were interacting with some other intelligence it's not surprising because the brain still has to kind of model it right uh, even if you are interacting with some in in intelligence that is perhaps formless or unrepresentable is that a word non-representable that's a better version uh, even if it's completely non-representable your brain still has to find some kind of incorporating it into its usual way of modeling reality which is you know visual and auditory and you know um so it's not surprising your brain is going to draw on these basic archetypal patterns but you have to remember that the archetypes the very simple structures they're 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 carried from our ancestral past uh, the basic fundamental ways of modeling certain characters and uh, certain social relationships a relationship to your mother, the relationship to enemies. Um, these are very simple, important, emotionally charged social interactions that tend that give you the propensity, the inherited propensity to form certain types of images. But they don't. What they don't explain is the um, the the extreme complexity and the. Uh, the the intent and the intelligence and the behavior of these entities that's not something that's encoded in my opinion um you know in my neuroscientific opinion that's not something that you inherit that's encoded deep in your brain that's something else that seems to be um, your brain is using that basic archetypal model to give you the overall form of the entity but the the actual entity itself seems to transcend anything that you could explain in terms of archetypes um so so that takes us to the next possibility is that that we are actually dealing with some kind of other intelligence here. And that's always been my um, my hunch, my belief. Well, belief's the wrong word, but um, I've, I've always struggled to explain these entities um, in any other way that they seem to be. We seem to be interacting with some other um extremely advanced intelligence that that is from our perspective incomprehensibly intelligent and incomprehensibly advanced advanced more you know far more advanced than than uh, than than ourselves um, um so that would be the other explanation i think um because otherwise it's quite difficult to explain the commonalities and why people do seem to see the same kind of beings interacting with them in the same kind of ways, undergoing the same kind of procedures um, with these same types of same kind of personalities and character and intent and behavior and that kind of thing. Andrew, what, what do you think mm. the evolutionary functionality is, though, of this reality changing capacity with DMT, when we know that the tryptomers are all through nature, it's not just humans that have them. And there's this archetypal um you know the praying mantis is very common 
Um, it's like, it makes me wonder if, if DMT is in all things, you know, in the ayahuasca culture, we, we drink the ayahuasca brew with mixture plants with DMT. There's plant intelligences in the as, uh, Amazonian cosmovision. Um, but DMT seems to be in all things, which would imply if its functionality is to switch reality channels, then all things can also tap into all realities. And then it, it starts to get very metaphysical in the sense of, what is the identity of the individuality across all these species lines? And it's almost like parallel processing in this multiplicity of alternate worlds in the multiverse type of deal. It's like, it's complicated, but it gets even more complicated when you go beyond the humanity of it. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's a bit much. Yeah, I, th I agree with you. It's yeah, where to start with that. I mean, it does, you do get this this sense that we have lost something in recent um, millennia, uh, and that we are reconnecting in in a certain way uh, with something which you know, uh, kind of a, a hyper dimensional heritage of some sort that we have um, that is valuable uh, and that may well have been extremely valuable from an evolutionary and adaptive perspective in our in our past, and that somehow we have lost that. Um, and we have become very um, much more concretely fixed within um, this lower dimensional space that we, we exist in and that, that DMT is kind of reactivating this ancestral function in some way, which is why perhaps it's, it's so familiar and there's this great sense of coming home uh, when you take DMT uh, and that perhaps it is... Um, part of our nature our deeply embedded ancestral nature to be in contact uh, with a much more a much broader reality within which you know there are you know extremely diverse populations of intelligences of all different forms and that we're kind of reconnecting to that so it's not necessarily something completely new i don't think um i think maybe the brain has been doing it or was doing it for 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 millennia before we kind of forgot about it or um stopped doing it um and um and so so yeah awesome uh, and just so everyone knows uh thank you chelly chelly was saying uh the uh the molecule you were talking about with the auditory um was uh dipt uh dipt yeah i, I um is there a difference? I guess, yeah, I remember working with 5-MeO DIPT back in the late 90s a few times. That was a very interesting one. It was a very, very interesting one. All right. Next question. What neurological explanations can account for individual differences in tolerance, whether 5-MeO or NNDMT? Um, yeah. Um, so... The different types of tolerance, first of all. So you get like intrinsic tolerance or a susceptibility, if you like, to certain drugs. So some someone, you know, the first time, so, so you, you get the tolerance over time, you get accumulated tolerance. Uh, if you take a drug over an extended period of time, you, you will build up a tolerance. And you see that with many drugs. You see it with alcohol and you see it with the opiates and, and and also with the psychedelics as well and there are many there's several different mechanisms for how that works uh, but certainly there's also a kind of an intrinsic um, tolerance or susceptibility so someone might need 30 milligrams of dmt to completely break through uh, whereas for other people it will take 40 50 60 milligrams and there is a small population around five percent uh, that's borne out by um, Rick Strassman's study. I mean, Terence McKenna back in the um, back in the eighties would said that you know about five percent of people, when he gave them, you know, um, two three full lungs of of DMT, and and they would experience nothing. Um, and then Rick Strassman found that of the sixty people or so that he injected with DMT, even at the highest dose levels, they experienced no effects. So it's kind of it sounds appalling, doesn't it? If you if you happen to be in, in one of those groups and there's really nothing you can do about it, uh, that's it. It's like, it doesn't matter how much DMT you consume, you'll never uh, be able to experience any effects. And why is that the case? Um, 
so again it goes back to receptors um in that um dmt is binding to this receptor a receptor is a protein and a protein is in, is in, encoded as a long chain of amino acids which is ultimately encoded in your dna your base sequences in your dna um and everyone carries slightly different versions we all you know these are called polymorphism in that everyone has slight different versions to slightly different genetic sequences genes that encode these receptors so although everyone has 5ht2a receptors um that some people will have slightly different versions um different polymorphisms uh, which might be less susceptible that might not bind, for example, they're slightly different shape. They might not bind to the DMT molecule uh, as effectively or at all. Uh, it's not been studied. So it's, this is kind of educated, semi-educated speculation. Uh, but that that could be an explanation for why, um, you know, and then there would be kind of intermediate where somebody's receptors they bind to dmt and they can still experience the effects but it takes more dmt in order to kind of saturate those receptors and then you've got differences in metabolic rates as well so people will metabolize again because of proteins they will metabolize drugs at different rates um and so you know accumulating a certain amount of, of dmt in, in the brain is more difficult uh, than with other people um, so then you get um, tolerance over time. And what's interesting about DMT is that you don't seem to experience that. And you can take DMT several times a day if you wanted to. And um, the effect is basically the same each time. So lack of subjective tolerance is, is interesting with uh, with DMT. Uh, but with most drugs, you get you get tolerance over time. And again, it, it's all to do with changes in your neurochemistry, changes in the, the expression of certain receptors and uh, upregulation, downregulation of receptors, um, changes in the uh, metabolic milieu in, in your body and in your brain, which can be affected by these drugs over time. So, so the kind of the important message really is you can never really predict for the first time that you use a psychedelic, how you're going to respond to it. Um, so it, it's it's wrong to say, um, you know, 30 milligrams is what you need to break through or whatever. Uh, for some people, that's going to be the case. For some people, it will be a massive overshoot. And for some people, it will be a massive undershoot. Um, so always the first time if you are um, using any kind of psychedelic is to start low. You can always take more. You can't take less once you've taken it. <laughs> Can I just add to that that um, I think there's a, also a microbiome connection? I had a facility friend in Mexico that was working with 5-MeO and she said she worked with these in, uh, local people that never drank water, only drank Coca-Cola, and all of them across the board weren't affected by 5-MeO at all. Um, but, you know, the building blocks of the serotonin system and other the stomach biome going up to the vagus nerve to the brain biome, um, that really may be the case as well. I've had uh, experiences with, um, you know, knowledge of certain certain people that have very high thresholds and often with toad as well uh, is one form of 5-MeO there's only about 30 percent density of 5-MeO in there and it's hard to get enough in um, jaguar or the synthetic 5-MeO does seem to get people over that hump and sometimes it's extremely high amounts of synthetic 5-MeO can break people through ridiculously but it seems to me that there is a volume control or a tolerance but as you say maybe it's a just receptor sites obviously as well but it's uh it's it's a mystery hmm. so we had a question here that goes to rehash uh an old topic of discussion um so you know rick straussman uh you know popularly theorized that there is an endogenous release of dmt from the pineal gland whilst asleep or in a dream state what are your theories around this? Has there been new research to point that that may actually be something? Because I remember a lot of people ran with it kind of after the book came out and especially after the documentary came out and it was reported as fact. And um, and then, you know, he came out and said, no, this is this is just theory. What uh, what are your guys' thoughts here? Can I just jump in? Because Andrew will give you the correct answer after I say my <laughs> Um but yeah, I mean, Rick went to pains to say, look, this is just a theory. And of course, everyone loves a bumper sticker and a slogan and to keep it simple. Part of the issue is the, the legacy and the heritage of the, the mystical tradition, looking at the third eye of the pineal gland, which is obviously in the center of the head in total darkness. The problem which some scientists 
it explained to me is it's very difficult to get live tryptamine readings in the body or especially in the pineal gland because you're alive and you're going to carve you up and be dead. Someone was saying you'd have to do a, um, a catheter uh, in the bone marrow up on the spine to get live uh, fresh readings of tryptamines because they evaporate very quickly in, in, in air. Um, so there's all of that. But in general, what I hear from some of the 5-MeO community of practitioners who are well established with this, and obviously we want to know the right science, but there does seem to be something tantalizing about the, the, the pineal gland. And there was that study in the last few years looking at rats and confirming that melatonin is produced in the pineal gland in rats. So we're making a leap to say that it's, maybe it's likely for melatonin. The current theory in the facilitator underground of some very well-placed individuals who've been working for over a decade with thousands of people suggests that there's some process by which melatonin may, and again, I might be getting this language wrong, methylate or somehow be a building block to build 5-MeO itself. So I guess in general, for many years from the Strassman study, NN in general, and maybe 5-MeO in, in comparison, it was believed these substances are produced in the lungs, the cerebrospinal fluid, maybe the adrenals. Um, and, you know, but recently, again, there's like the, the sort of backtracking on those ideas that there's still no concrete evidence of that in those areas, or maybe there's a residue that they're overflowing and appearing in those when they do the studies. But we come back to this pineal gland. I mean, you know, I, I really... I'm just sad that science look at, at mysticism with a scientific lens and find the right tonality of language and explore these these per, these terrain and parameters, because that pineal gland definitely seems to be they you know set the seat of consciousness in the human human being. Now over to Andrew. <laughs> okay, yeah. So yeah, I mean you covered the you know, kind of the, the the key point here, which was that that Strasman's idea um that dmt i mean strasman particularly was was uh, like the idea that that dmt was released at death um that it was it, it provided the conduit to allow the soul to exit the body and this is why why we call it or some people call it i don't but some people call it the spirit molecule right um that was rick strasman's idea the important during death and so you have these two kind of not so much myths, so to, so to speak, but two kind of ideas little um, that have, have been promoted as being fact, which is the idea that DMT is produced a little bit when you dream and then a lot when you die. Uh, and so many different people I've heard this from and spoken as if it's complete fact. Uh, unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem to be. Um, firstly, well, let's tackle the dream thing. Um, we know a lot about dreams. People have been studying the phenomenology of dreams for hundreds of years. And scientifically, certainly in the 20th century, um, there's been a lot of work on the phenomenology of dreaming. The dreaming phenomenology, if dreams were a result of nocturnal um, DMT secretion, whether by the pineal, pineal or other parts of the brain or elsewhere in the body, uh, you'd expect that the phenomenology of dreaming to be very similar to DMT. And um, in most cases, it's just not the case. D dreams are very similar. <laughs> You're just looking like that, Rack. Is that, maybe your dreams are kind of different, but... No, no, uh, mostly... <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, you know, most dreams are basically continuous with waking. You dream about the things that you see in the normal waking world. Your brain is modeling the world in the dream state as it does during um, waking life. Um, so, so no, I don't think DMT, it makes any sense that, that, that D DMT is stimulating production of dreams. I mean, that goes back to an old idea actually of Jace Calloway in the eighties. He thought that maybe DMT was responsible for the visions of dreaming, but again, the phenomenology doesn't match. It doesn't make any sense. Um, the going to the pineal itself, um, it's Dave Nichols did a very good analysis of this a few years ago um the the the, the pineal is a very small gland i mean it's the size of the end of your your little finger really uh it's capable of producing nanograms um or micrograms at most of melatonin very very small amounts of of this melatonin hormone neurohormone melatonin um so the idea that it can only kind of start pumping out milligrams um of of dmp so you know you're talking sort of two orders of magnitude probably uh, of, of, of quantity of, of, of tryptamine that it has to start producing. Uh, the pineal is just not up to the job. 
um, to do that, I think. So it doesn't really make any sense. I think that the pineal is releasing enough DMT at any point to um, to to. to the, to, Can I ask, though, had they actually studied this or they're conjecturing it couldn't be possible? One of the key things that needs to be factored here is dark and light because there are still traditions in Mexico and Mantak Chia, the Tantric Masters, there's darkness retreats, that people that have gone on them. The, the thinking is in total darkness after seven or ten days, melatonin, melatonin, and tryptamine leaves the body and um, the other tryptamines aggregate in darkness. And we know ayahuasca culture is often most likely done in darkness. And there seems to be something about darkness, obviously related to the pineal gland and inducing melatonin. But unless we've got a live study with electrodes in there in darkness, how do we really know? Okay, yeah, we don't 100% know. Um, that's true. Um, so you have to have that that caveat. Certainly darkness. I mean, darkness, I mean, there's confounding variables there in that um, darkness is a state of reduced sensory stimulation. And once you, we know that, you know, you can put somebody in a, a sensory deprivation chamber or float tank or something, and, and they will start to have visions. It's, it's not, you don't have to to invoke any releasing DMT to explain that. Uh, but once the brain is no longer, if you like, distracted by having more based upon incoming sensory information, then it, you, you tend to get self-generated activity. And so you get the emergence of, 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 of um, hallucinations, visions, basically. So I don't think necessarily because people use darkness that that means that they're kind of activating the pineal. They could be. Uh, but again, it's it is pure speculation, and the pineal. I mean, why focus on the pineal? I mean, that's always my thing. It's like, well, you know, every every neuron in the brain, pretty much every cell in the brain, is capable of producing um, DMT. I mean, DMT is two steps from uh, tryptophan. Uh, it's it's very closely related. It, you just need to diverge slightly from the serotonin pathway, and you'll get DMT, or even indeed five meo DMT. So I don't. It doesn't really make sense, apart from that mystical connection, the tradition there associated with the pineal. DMT could be more, much more likely to be uh, more wide, uh, widely produced by the brain or even indeed the lungs, um, which also contain the, the, the appropriate enzyme. And that would make sense um, if we think of DMT as, as e, e, uh, Edie Fresco and Dennis McKenna's work showed that, that DMT is neuroprotective in times of um um hypoxia um the lungs would be a good site for detecting that uh, in a condition of low oxygen um that the lungs might start producing dmt which of course goes straight into your brain and and helps to protect protect uh, your neurons there um so and also there have been studies that have looked at uh, way back now, a few decades ago, that actually measured DMT concentrations in the bloodstream and in the urine over a 24-hour period, uh, and DMT and its metabolites, hoping to see if there is some kind of diurnal pattern, see if you know, DMT levels rise when you're asleep, but then fall again when you're awake. Unfortunately, there is no pattern that could be detected. Um, that doesn't mean it's not there, it doesn't mean it's not being produced but it's an indication again that there, there doesn't seem to be an increase in dmt levels uh, during dreaming uh, and finally uh, well the death thing i mean what can you say i mean who knows right we, we, we can't really be measuring or very difficult to measure dmt levels in someone's brain at the moment of death uh, it's very hard to get subjects for that kind of uh, study or ethical um, permission to do that kind of study um but so that will as, as, as a grand speculation uh, as, as DMT as a spirit molecule. In terms of melatonin being converted to DMT, you can't convert melatonin to DMT. Melatonin has this 5-methoxy group. Um, so you can't easily cleave that off and form DMT. So melatonin can't be a precursor to DMT. It could be a precursor, however, to 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, which is also much more potent as well. You need much less of 5-MeO. Um, so that is, in my mind, makes more sense because we know the pineal is always, already doing that 5, meth, met, five met, addition of that 5-methoxy group uh, to tryptamine. Um, all you have to do is cleave off this 
uh, acetal group that you've got on the nitrogen of of melatonin and then you can dimethylate that and then you've got 5-MeO-DMT. So actually it may, may, might make more sense that the pineal is producing 5-MeO-DMT than it does that it's producing DMT. I love it. Thank you guys. Well, we are running out of time right now, but there is one more question that we're going to rock out because Chelly was kind enough to uh, bless us with the molecule name. And uh, Mr. Larry, I see your hand is raised, but it was a Q&A section and it's not a uh, an answering uh Live, uh, live question type of setup, my friend. So Chelly had asked, this is a question for you, Andrew. I am, de I am a developer focusing on a graphical representation of dynamical and ancient systems, which he touches upon on alien information theory. Does he also believe that perhaps these entities or hyperspace consciousnesses are emergent properties of some cosmic system? Could the world space landscape you speak about also be a morphogenic process? When you talk about an orthogonal projection of hyperspace, do you mean that it's a part of the worldscape landscape? World space landscape, excuse me. Um, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of kind of intersecting questions there. Um, but yeah, I think the, so all, cons, well, in my opinion, I mean, all life is, is uh, life is an emergent property of, matter or of stuff whatever it might even be an emergent property of consciousness it's an emergent everything emerges uh through these layers of hierarchical organization and we kind of sit at what seems to be the upper end of that um um and so that would also apply to in my opinion beings intelligences presumably and we don't really know of course uh because we don't know anything about really about their domain where it its origins are um or or its structure or its relationship to ours so I think there's there's a certain amount of speculation well a massive amount of speculation kind of um extrapolating the emergence of intelligences and of conscious beings and life forms in our reality and, and extrapolating that and assuming that it works the same way perhaps in a higher dimensional space um it could be that um, in fact, our lower dimensional space is something that has been constructed and not necessarily a simulation as such, uh, but something that has been uh, a, uh, a playground for the emergence of conscious intelligences uh, happening on a, a lower dimensional slice of a, this high dimensional system within which these beings reside, whether they themselves emerged um, from some cosmic process, I think possibly um that would be the default position uh, but it's also possible that these intelligences have always been there i mean that's another possibility um that actually are timeless and ageless um whereas we have clearly emerged on a fairly recent temporal scale um um so the short answer is 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 as we don't know and the, the the second part of the question i i missed uh we already deleted it <laughs> right. where did the uh the q a go uh the sec <laughs> um when you talk about an orthogonal projection of hyperspace do you mean that it's a part of the world space landscape yeah, I mean, the world space landscape is basically all possible worlds that your brain can construct. So I don't make claims about um, so your brain is this world builder and and the, the total kind of state space of the brain represents contains all possible worlds that your brain can construct. And so this forms this attractor landscape, which I call the world space landscape. Uh, but I don't make any claims about how these each of these areas of the world space landscape is mapped to other realities. It might be because we know that we occupy a small, normally in normal waking life, we occupy a small region of this world space landscape where it is mapped in some way to some external environment. You're receiving information from some external environment. So it's possible that as you, you look out over the whole of this world space landscape, because the DMT space is also a part, is a region, a district within this world space landscape. Uh, is it that all these different regions are mapped to different types of realities or different areas within some grand super reality, right? Uh, and so as you move through, stimulate, perturbed by different psychedelic drugs, different 
drug technologies, if you like. Uh, it's allowing you within each area of the world's based landscape to actually start interfacing and receiving information from some other dimension, some other aspect, some other perspective uh, within this grander uh, reality. And so we're kind of moving through and sort of picking up different pieces of this larger structure. And perhaps 5M or DMT uh, to kind of bookend that idea is, is allowing you to kind of experience all of it or even to transcend all of that complex um, um, playground, if you like, you know, uh, uh, of the mind uh, and transcend all of that and, and view everything perhaps all at once, um, which would be like a white light experience, perhaps. Oof. yeah good stuff <laughs> yeah th thank you both so much for for being here and i feel like this conversation could literally go on forever mm -hmm. um but for those in the audience who want to learn more about you where can they find each of you rack and andrew i'm at rackrazam.com and uh i've actually wanted to say i've got a, a, an ebook that's a collection of um interviews i've done with people around five video and that's at rackrazam.com forward slash in a perfect world ebook with hyphens between the world it's hard to find but um yeah i look forward to um i've got a lot more material on 5meo and of course the more subjective spiritual sort of mystic bent but obviously with some science thrown in there as well so thank you it's been fun to hang out mm, thank you Rad. great to have you um yeah so you can find me at alieninsect.net um so you get links to my uh, many of my interviews and papers and you can look at my two books uh, alien Inf information theory and reality switch technologies which is the latest book covering all the different psychedelics and how they work in the brain how they all structure and dynamics of your experienced world so if you really want to get into the neuroscience of how psychedelics work then reality switch technologies is the book you can also follow me on twitter where i'm fairly active again my handle is alien insect i'm on instagram as alien insect alien insect basically um but you to me pretty quickly awesome thank you thank you and thank you everybody for joining us tonight um just one last announcement as you may have heard we do have an upcoming study in january um we are taking 32 healthy volunteers and if you would like to apply to be a volunteer um please apply through the five site again that is the number five then dash meo.education and uh Applying to that, just know we are only looking for people who have already experienced 5-MeO-DMT. We are also looking for people who are in a stable state and are not in a healing process. We are also looking for people who are known to sit still when they do 5-MeO-DMT, as our dear brother Merrill Ward would call the Buddha sitters. And uh, I'm a Buddha from like the waist up, you know? From the waist down, it's a whole nother story on five. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, Rack seen it. I... My legs just have a life of their own. Oh, right. Happy feet. Yeah, we call it happy feet. But when, when my feet are doing that, I, you know, I'm in a good place. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much. Rack, Andrew, thank you both thank so you. much. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you for all of your work. I followed both of your work for quite a long time. Uh, Andrew, I have, I'm on your mailing list and get your uh, your regular emails and I've really um, enjoyed what I've read into the work that you've done. Um, really, really intriguing stuff. Rack, of course, um, Rack's podcast was one of the main influences for me in the in the mid and late 2000s or 2010s that uh, really helped open everything up for me. And so both of you, thank you for this work you've done with these medicines. Thank you for the work that you've done for the world. And uh, let's keep it all going. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you all. Muchas gracias. Ciao, everybody. Have a beautiful thank night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.